Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> this weekend will mark the one-year anniversary of our first confirmed COVID-19 case in Vermont. I was at a Norwich University hockey game when I received the call, and I'm not sure any of us imagined what the year ahead would bring. But as we reflect on this anniversary, instead of talking about the many challenges we face, sacrifices we've made, and the losses we've shared, I want to focus on why I believe we should be optimistic about the road ahead. When we had that first case, nobody could have predicted just 12 months later, we'd already have three safe and effective vaccines rolling out to defend ourselves. Think about that. Just one year after the worst pandemic in a century was at our doorstep, caused by a brand new virus never before experienced in humans, we're able to protect the most vulnerable from hospitalization or death. As of yesterday, 20% of all Vermonters over the age of 16 have now received at least one dose of the vaccine. And as we announced on Tuesday, we're moving into phase five of our rollout, which includes about 75,000 of those with underlying health conditions, as well as educators and more public safety personnel. In a few minutes, Secretary Smith will provide a logistical update on how this rollout will work. But this means within a month, one third of the eligible population could be vaccinated. And all the most vulnerable, fear, illness, and death will have had the opportunity to be protected. As a result, we should see our hospitalization rate, as well as fatalities, continue to decrease, as they have over the last month. And with the possibility of an increased supply, it's possible we'll be able to open eligibility much sooner than we originally could have hoped for. And we're seeing other positive trends as well. Two weeks ago, we began lifting some restrictions for those who had been fully vaccinated. This included travel-free quarantine, as well as allowing those vaccinated to gather with another household, even if that other household is not vaccinated. As we said at the time, this change has a lot of ripple effects on other mitigation policies we have in place. Our restart team, which receives guidance from Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso, has been working through these over the last several days. And we anticipate being able to safely turn the spigot in a few more areas beginning next week. But we are able to announce one change now. Effective today, people who are vaccinated can gather with other vaccinated individuals at their homes. For example, if eight fully vaccinated individuals, individuals wanted to get together at someone's house for dinner, they're now able to do so. This can also include one other household that is not vaccinated. Keep in, keep in mind, we know this will lead to other questions. And as I said, we're planning to have further announcements next week. So again, as we've done from the start of the pandemic, we're taking a cautious, methodical, and strategic approach. But with more and more Vermonters protected by the vaccine, I'm confident we'll be able to make continued progress. Next, uh, I'm pleased to say we have a special guest joining us today from Washington, Senator Leahy, to give us an update on the Senate version of the relief package. I've had many conversations uh, over the last few weeks with Senator Leahy, as well as Senator Sanders and Congressman Welch about what we'd like to see as part of this package. I'm so very appreciative of Senator Leahy's work. We're very fortunate to have his leadership in Washington as he continues to deliver in a big way for our state. So with that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Senator Leahy. Welcome, Senator. Okay, uh, Governor, it's, uh, it's good to see you even though it's this way. I, uh, I would much rather be there with you in person, but you can probably see from the background, I'm not in my farmhouse in Middlesex, Vermont. Uh, this is 
little bit different down here. I'm just a few feet from, in fact, you've been in this office, you, you know it, and I, I, we're going to be having a lot of votes on it. And Wednesday, I was able to join Dr. Levine. Uh, he was in Burlington, and uh, I was able to join him the same way. I appreciate the fact that you're doing this. Uh, I have talked... I've talked with people all over our state, uh, from the north to the south, uh, hundreds of Vermonters in the last uh, few months, as well, since this all began. And people want it to be over, obviously. I know you do, everybody does. And uh, they want to get back to normal. They want people to be together. Uh, Marcel and I have been very, very careful, even with our own children and grandchildren uh, until we were uh, vaccinated. We, we look at the 15,000 Vermonters who infected, 200 deaths, uh, but Governor I've worked with you and with Bernie and with Peter on this and trying to get things through. And one of the things we're doing, and we're voting on it right now, uh, is what's going to be in the uh, COVID bill. And if I could just fill you in a little bit on that. Uh, Vermont received $1,250,000,000 from the uh, coronavirus and, and local recovery fund. Uh, we increased that uh, $400 million over what was in the House. Uh, Bernie and I worked in the Senate. I know Peter worked very hard in the House. We said before it came up, we wanted to add more money, and we have done that. Um, the vaccine distribution effects we've raised from the December allocation, 27 million more, uh, 50 million for an all-state minimum for the homeowner assistant fund. But here's one thing that, that I really fought for, and you and I have talked about this a lot. Uh, we set aside a hundred million dollars specifically for Vermont to be able to spend on infrastructure like broadband. I, I, I have talked with so many dozens, hundreds actually of families that the kids can't go to school. They're doing it virtually, but they don't have adequate broadband to do it here in Vermont. They do in some parts of the state, not in others, which you understand so well. Uh, I know, I know the way it is in Middlesex, for example, it's sporadic, uh, but this will this will help. We've got to be able to do that. You know, and I know that a lot of businesses will change in Vermont in the way we do it. There'll be more things remote, but we also are our, our, our small inns and uh, our mail order businesses and all. They have to have this to work. But uh, the 27 million for vaccination efforts, that's going to make Vermont whole from the uh, December allocation. And I know you and I talked about the fact you were concerned the state had received far less funding than anticipated. I know you were trying to make sure we had it, and this will help. And the uh, 50 million, the all state minimum in the homeowner assistance fund, that's in there. Uh, these, I realize these are numbers, but Governor, I, I mean, you and I have so many conversations, uh, sometimes on weekends and evenings and all about this. Uh, I've talked with the Lieutenant Governor a lot about it. I, uh, I've, but it's the hundreds of Vermonters I've heard all over the state. Uh, they don't care whether we're Republicans or Democrats or independents. They just want our state to be the way it was. They want to hug their children. They want to, they want to have cookouts with their neighbors. They want to be able to go to church or synagogue. They want to go uh, in the grocery store. And you know what it's like. I, I know when, when Marcel and I go to the grocery store in, when we're home in Vermont, uh, we sometimes take an extra 45 minutes to an hour just because everybody wants to stop and talk. And 
I learned from that. I hope they do. So I, I will hush at this point, but we will uh, we will be voting until one or two o'clock, three o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, but the path is very very good. Uh, I'll preside over a lot of that uh, debate as President Pro Tem. Although I gave up the chair yesterday to the vice president because we had a tied vote. I can't break the tie. She can. And uh, and we got forward on the bill. And hopefully that relief will be coming soon. But thank you for what you've done. Uh, I appreciate the fact you've worked so hard to keep our state safe. And I look forward to seeing you there maybe in a couple of weeks. Well, Thank you very much, Senator Leahy, for coming on and um, reporting such great news for the state of Vermont. Um, we're very blessed uh, here in Vermont to have such a strong delegation in Congress, uh, led by Senator Leahy, uh, always, always staying in contact with uh, leadership throughout Vermont and uh, listening to our concerns. And, uh, and I'm, I'm more confident than ever uh, that by uh, mid-July, I mean, things are going to look so much different than they do today. And uh, with your help, with the help of uh, this package coming to, with a, uh, to us, uh, we'll come out of this uh, pandemic stronger than we went in. I'm confident of that. And, uh, and again, uh, Senator Leahy has uh, provided uh, a, a major piece of, uh, of that puzzle in order to do so. So uh, thank you again. And with that, thank I'll- uh, Thank you, and, I, and I'm running now to the floor to vote. I know Marcel's watching online and the others in my office will. Thank you very much for inviting me. Good, good luck and stay safe, Senator. Uh, with that, uh, we'll now turn it over to uh, uh, Secretary French, who's on video. Uh, good morning, Governor. Uh, surveillance testing uh, for school staff was not held this week. Uh, we decided not to hold the testing uh, due to a large number of districts around winter break last week. It's difficult uh, to work out scheduling details uh, for the testing when school's not in session. Uh, we will re be in, uh, start the uh, testing again next week. Uh, from an operations standpoint, much of our planning work this week was focused on standing up the new vaccination program for school staff. Uh, Secretary Smith will provide more information on that in a minute. I did want to share uh, information from the vaccination surveys that we conducted. Uh, these surveys were implemented to give us a sense of the interest in vaccination among school staff and childcare staff uh, to help with our planning efforts. We had 15,241 school staff respond to the survey uh, and 92% indicated an interest in getting vaccinated. We had 2,229 childcare staff respond to their survey uh, and 81% indicated an interest in getting vaccinated. So we're now working closely uh, with AHS, other state partner agencies and school districts to implement the vaccination program. Uh, we're working with each individual district, independent school and child care provider uh, to obtain specific headcount information and to schedule the vaccination clinics. The vaccination of school staff will likely have a significant impact on our ability to offer more in-person instruction this spring. As the weather gets warmer and conditions for the transmission of the virus improve in our communities, New opportunities will emerge uh, for creative solutions to challenges such as distancing requirements. I thought I would highlight an example of one such solution from the Windsor Central Supervisory Union. Uh, that district, working in partnership uh, with the Billings Farm and Museum, is now providing in-person instruction four days a week for all the students at Woodstock Elementary School. Woodstock Elementary School is a fairly large elementary school <clears throat> with about 333 students in grades pre-K through six. I visited uh, the school prior to COVID, and I can say the school is a very vibrant and bustling learning community uh, with very few spaces not being utilized for student learning. Since the fall, it's been very challenging for them to accommodate all their students with the distancing requirements. Students in grades pre-K through two were in person four days a week, but students of the other grades were in hybrid uh, for the rest of the time. Thanks to the generosity and support of Billings, uh, they were able to move their sixth graders to the activity barn at Billings for four days a week of in-person learning. This has allowed students in grades three through five uh, to have more space at the school and to expand their learning model to also have four days a week in person. 
So as a result, uh, now all students at Woodstock Elementary are receiving four days a week of in-person learning. Not all communities have a Billings Fire Museum, but all have local resources of some sort that can be leveraged to enact a more in-person instruction, which is essential to our recovery work. I thought I would expand a bit on thinking uh, about this relationship between recovery work and education versus our goal of more in-person instruction. I think this comparison can be summed up by the phrase ends versus means. Our goal or end is to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on the education and healthy development of our children. This is our recovery work. To make progress towards our goal of mitigating the impact, we need to implement more in-person contact with students. This is why a return to more in-person is critical. The sooner we can restore more in-person instruction, the sooner we can stop the negative impacts of the pandemic and we can begin the work of the recovery. As we begin planning this rec recovery work, it's important to acknowledge that although this work will certainly have an academic focus, we will also need to attend to the social and emotional needs of students by reestablishing connections with their peers and their teachers. This socialization is critical to their healthy development and probably the area where remote learning falls short the most. The example of Woodstock Elementary School and the Billings Farm Museum is not an example just of creative solution to solve space issues, but also can be seen as a very effective recovery strategy in itself. Think back to when you were in sixth grade and try to remember how important the regular interaction with your friends was to your learning in your daily life. Imagine then what it would feel like to spend the better part of your school year learning in relative isolation and at a distance over a computer. And now think about how excited you'd be to return to school with your classmates when your new classroom is located on the grounds of a historic Vermont farm and where you are not only surrounded by your friends and teachers, but also a beautiful herd of Jersey cows. I have no doubt this experience of these Woodstock students will be the experience they remember when they are asked by their children someday, what was school like during the COVID-19 pandemic? This will also be the experience they remember when they look back on the school year because they are going to end the year on a celebratory note. These kinds of celebratory and positive experiences are all part of our recovery work. We need to find ways to return to more in-person instruction this spring to ensure all of our students can end the year in a positive way. Conditions for the virus will likely improve quickly in the coming weeks as the pace of vaccination increases. Also, with warmer weather, uh, schools will be able to resurrect some of the creative solutions to outdoor learning that we saw them use in the fall. In short, Vermont will be in a very good position to implement more in-person instruction in the coming weeks. Finally, I uh, wanted to congratulate the Burlington School District for having their high school students return to in-person this week. I know Superintendent Flanagan and his staff, as well as the school board, have worked extremely hard to find a solution to their facility issues. It was really great to see uh, the enthusiasm of the students for returning to school on the news this week. Uh, that concludes my report. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Tuesday's press conference was full of exciting announcements, and this has been another busy week. We are encouraged by the overall progress of the vaccination program. Here's what we want to talk about today. First, I'll provide an update on our vaccination program progress. Next, I'll update on the progress to build capacity to vaccinate even more Vermonters. And then I will provide more information on the vaccination efforts that will begin on Monday, March 8th for teachers and staff in schools and child care centers, public safety, and the Department of Corrections staff. And lastly, as we see the light, the bigger light, it's getting bigger every day, the bigger light at the end of the pandemic uh, tunnel, many families are struggling and I will share some resources that they may be able to help them uh, during their struggles. So let's start with the overall progress. We are pleased by participation in and the progress of the vaccination program. As of today, 1,013, uh, 100,013, 865 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. Just to repeat that again, 113,865 people. 52,631 have received their first dose of vaccine. 61,234 have received their first and last doses of the vaccine. As of 9 a.m. this morning, among those age 65 and above, 
23,486 people have made appointments. Just to remind everybody, 65 and above is open for registration. If you haven't, please register, and I'll talk about other, um, other uh, availability of uh, registering as well. But to create an account or make an op uh, appointment, go to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. The call center for homebound individuals is now active. If you are homebound and have not already been contacted or made an appointment to be vaccinated, please call the Department of Health at, and this is a new number, 833-722-0860. I just want to repeat that, 833-722-0860, Monday through Friday, from 8.30 to 4.30. That's a different number than the vaccination registration number. The Vermont National Guard has available appointments for eligible Vermonters at the Doubletree in South Burlington this Saturday and Sunday. Please make an appointment at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. As a reminder, Walmart started vaccinations today in six stores in Vermont. Costco received their shipment of vaccines yesterday and will begin vaccinating today. You must register for these appointments through the state website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. You should not call the stores directly. And Kenny's Drugs uh, will conduct a large vaccination event for eligible Vermonters at, uh, in, at Spalding High School uh, this Sunday. I believe most of the slots, it's a big event. It's about, it's about uh, 1,100 doses, but I think most of the slots are uh, filled, but check uh, Kinney's website to make sure. Also, Walgreens will continue to offer vaccinations through the federal program they participate, uh, participate in. Again, you can choose to make an appointment with Walgreens or Kinney Drugs directly if it's more convenient for you, or you can go on our website and make an appointment that way as well. Now let's turn our attention to phase five, Vermonters age 16 to 64 with high risk health conditions. As I mentioned earlier this week, phase five is a large group of Vermonters approximately 75,000 people, and it's divided into two segments. Phase 5A, if you are 55 years old and above with an eligible high-risk condition, you can make an appointment to receive a vaccine beginning Monday at Mar on March 8th. And for Phase 5B, those 16 years old and above, with an eligible high-risk condition, you can make your appointment beginning Monday, March 15th. A list of eligible high-risk conditions is available at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. You will make an appointment in our system in the same way Vermonters have done by age grouping at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or by calling the Vaccine Call Center at 855-722-7878. Seven, eight. You do not, you do not need to contact your health care provider or get documentation of the high risk condition to, uh, to make an appointment. On Monday, March 8th, we will also begin offering teachers and school staff the option to be vaccinated. And on March 15th, regulated child care programs will be eligible to be vaccinated at clinics in their district. Starting next week, our allocation of Johnson & Johnson will, not be, will be less than what we expected. Therefore, we also will be utilizing Pfizer vaccine to augment, and that's extra doses of Pfizer's uh, uh, vaccine that came back uh, through the long-term care program to augment supply. EMS, Department of Health staff, the Vermont National Guard, Healthcare partners and school nurses will be on site at vaccination clinics, uh, school districts, or in smaller schools to assist with this effort. Teachers and uh, school staff who wish to be vaccinated at the school designated vaccine sites can do so next week. We have seven districts scheduled for next week. They are Harwood Union in the Waterbury area, Springfield, Barrie, 
North Country, Rutland City, Mill River, and all Bennington County District schools. Details are being finalized for at least 28 additional clinics in the next few weeks. As I mentioned earlier this week, we are starting small to ensure we have the right capacity and participants to maximize efficiency. The program will start slowly and will ramp up quickly in the next couple of weeks. We ask for your patience during this process. Now here's how it will happen. The K through 12 Education Committee, uh, Community and Regulated Child Care Program staff will receive information on how and when they will be vaccinated and instructions on how to register directly from their employers. Again, please do not attempt to make an appointment until you hear from your employer. Appointments will be preloaded into the system and will occur over the next few weeks. You can also make an appointment at Walgreens. You will be asked to attest to qualify. Please note you, uh, if you make an appointment through the Vermont Department of Health and you end up getting the vaccine at a pharmacy, this is important. Please cancel your other appointment. Lastly, beginning Monday, March, uh, I also wanna say that beginning shortly, and it will be shortly, we will be registering 1A, uh, qualified 1A uh, Vermonters through the VDH registration system. As you may know, previously you went to your hospital but in the future, and we'll, we'll, we will announce it when it's ready, 1A will be coming through the centralized registration system of the state. We have not begun that, but we will be getting, beginning that shortly. Lastly, beginning Monday, March 8th, first responders, including police, fire, EMS, and staff who work in state correctional facilities that house detainees and incarcerated individuals will be offered a vaccine beginning this Saturday. Before I close, I do want to acknowledge that in addition to our vaccination efforts, important resources are available to mitigate the toll this pandemic has taken on our neighbors, our families, our communities, the economy, and overall well-being. If you are struggling, please get help. Call 211. They have the res uh, resources and can make referrals. And for families experiencing hunger, you may be able to reduce the burden through Three Squares Vermont. Please visit vermontfoodhelp.com. That's all one word, vermontfoodhelp.com for more information. I want to thank everyone. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you, Secretary Smith. I'll keep my comments rather brief since we've had an abundance of speakers this morning. We're reporting 126 cases today, no new deaths. The numbers of deaths continue to be very small in the state over a period of time, concomitant with the incredibly successful vaccination effort of our oldest Vermonters. I'm pleased to add there's also been a steady decline in the number of COVID-19 hospitalizations. 24 people in the hospital, six in the ICU. Our state positivity rate continues to be holding well at a manageable 1.7%. There's still much to be done to reduce the number of new cases and to prevent even a single additional death from this virus. Nonetheless, the promising story these numbers tell and the progress we've been making in vaccinating the people of Vermont are reasons for optimism, especially as you just heard, we mark a full year since the pandemic reached into our state. I must say it's been one of the fastest years I've experienced that we've gone from the first case to one in five Vermonters vaccinated against a new virus that never was in humans before in less than 365 days. At the same time, it's hard to believe that it has been that long. 
I want to state that it was one year ago this week that our public health laboratory started testing for the COVID-19 virus. And for quite a period of time, they were the only show in town. Uh, and that was the only place one could get testing. Since that time, we performed 124,674 tests with a combined effort by our lab staff and in partnership with members of the Vermont National Guard. For some perspective, this represents more than three and a half times the typical entire testing volume in a year. In addition, these teams have assembled and distributed over 209,000 collection kits to hospitals, long-term care facilities, schools, health care providers, and others across Vermont. The department's public health lab was the first in the state to offer testing. For the first four weeks of the pandemic, the lab staff worked very long hours, seven days a week, getting this done before other labs were on board and ready to test. These amazing employees gave and continue to give their all. Each and every one of them represent the best of public health. I owe them and everyone at the department I'm privileged to lead a debt of gratitude. This anniversary is also a time for us all to take stock of where we are today. Yes, vaccinations are being administered, but I want to remind people about testing. Testing continues to be critical to people staying healthy and to stop community spread of the virus and the outbreaks we continue to see. And importantly, the everyday prevention efforts are absolutely essential to our being able to end the pandemic's impact in Vermont. This weekend, because of a dramatic uptick in cases over the past several weeks in the Stowe area, we are offering testing in that community at the high school. To augment the already high and not fully utilized capacity that we have in Morrisville and Waterbury. And as you know, we've been watching and continue to watch the Franklin County numbers very closely and still have many opportunities throughout that county as well, coordinated by the Missisquoi Valley Rescue. And I've mentioned previously that our numbers in testing were dropping in terms of those seeking testing in Chittenden County and in the Burlington area specifically. Uh, in response to findings in the wastewater with regard to the new variant, uh, we announced that there were abundant testing opportunities still available within those communities, and I reiterate that today. Many of you may have heard how Texas and Mississippi are ending their mask requirements, as well as several other states, and opening restaurants and other facilities to full capacity as if the virus has magically disappeared. I could not disagree with these decisions more. Now, don't misunderstand me. I do want this for Vermont as well, maybe as much or more than anyone else does. But we only need to look back to last spring when premature actions by many states across the country to open up led to a steep increase in cases and then deaths and having to roll back those policies. Apparently, Dr. Fauci and the new CDC director, Dr. Walensky, agree with me. They are cautioning states to not go too quickly. I previously informed us all regarding the fact that the downturn in cases in the nation and region-wide has stalled somewhat and that we don't yet know what the full impact of the variant strains may be. While the B117 UK strain has yet to be found by genome sequencing in Vermont, the wastewater results in Burlington again showed high level of a mutation compatible with this strain. Some of the preliminary results in our own public health lab uh, also were compatible with this strain, and we're awaiting the whole genome sequencing from the respiratory samples that we've set. But I fully expect within the next day or several days or week that we can more formally announce we will have uh, officially recorded the first case from a variant strain. And no one should be surprised by that. In fact, as the CDC has indicated, it's expected that strain may become the dominant strain in the country in the month of March. 
We are tantalizingly close to beating this, but let's not fumble the ball on the one yard line. Remember, masks on faces, six foot spaces, uncrowded places, especially if you're not vaccinated. And now we can add to the list getting vaccinated. When it's your turn, and your turn will come, as you have heard, much sooner than you might have imagined. And soon we begin, can begin to move on to enjoying everything Vermont has to offer. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Start with Calvin. Uh, thank you, Governor. So the uh, ACLU says that you're responsible for the outbreak in the Newport uh, facility. Um, what's your response to their concerns? And could this have been prevented if we had uh, vaccinated inmates? You know, we've had a strategy uh, for quite some time to protect the most vulnerable, uh, those, those over the age of 65. Um, from hospitalization and death. Uh, we're just getting through the, that age group as, as we speak. Uh, we're moving on to those with the chronic conditions. Uh, that's been part of our strategy from day one. Um, we are, you know, uh, we have to uh, adhere to the supply that we're receiving. And we have to make these decisions based on uh, our priority. And we do this by the data and the science. And the data and the science has told us that we should be, should be concentrating on those over 65 and those with chronic conditions. And that's what we're doing. So um, the strategy that uh, with, the, uh, with the Johnson Johnson vaccine uh, coming into play, which just came through this week, we felt we could expand uh, 1A uh, to uh, those which, which are included in the public safety uh, system, uh, the correctional officers. I feel if we can uh, adhere, uh, if we can have the, the perimeter of the facilities and, and have those uh, correctional officers and staff vaccinated, then we can protect the in individuals uh, inside the facility, the offenders inside the facility. So again, we, we work on the data, the science, the data that didn't back up uh, the need for vaccinating that population. What, uh, you know, now, now that we're um, vaccinating teachers, um, would, would you consider vaccinating inmates as well? Here's my plan, uh, and we haven't fully uh, decided on this, um, but um, once we get through the education system so we can get our children back into school where they belong and where, uh, because of their, uh, of their health risks in terms of mental health and socialization and so forth, um, my hope is that we go back to age banding. It's the, the simplest, uh, most effective way uh, that we have, uh, we have found. We're seeing many other states. Um, I've had other governors call uh, and ask how we're doing what we're doing. Uh, and you can see uh, that many are going to age banding after abandoning uh, their strategy for, um, for other populations. So. Uh, I think they see the merits. Uh, we certainly do, and uh, it's my hope, and we'll, we'll do this, we'll make this decision as a team, that we go back uh, to the age banding just as soon as we finish with the education system. Thanks. Steve? All set, thank you. Moving to the phones with Stuart, NBC5. Morning. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the doses wasted at the Central Vermont Medical Center. Uh, the Digger report uh, cited uh, the hospital saying it was because they did not have a waiting list or sort of a mechanism to get those 99 doses into arms quickly. Is that something that might prompt a policy change? Uh, what are your thoughts about it? Well, again, I'll ask uh, Secretary Smith to comment as well. Uh, but from my perspective, we've seen uh, great success, success amongst all the other hospitals throughout the state. Uh, CVMC sticks out as the outlier. Uh, UVMMC uh, has uh, had uh, a vast distribution of vaccines uh, throughout their system. And they've only had, um, I guess, 25 or less uh, vaccines that have been wasted. So. Uh, there's a way, there's a strategy, they're the umbrella organization. 
Uh, and, I, uh, and I would just uh, say that uh, the policy we have in place uh, is pretty simple. If you can, if you can find uh, someone in, within the age group uh, that hasn't been vaccinated, you should do so. You should go through the hospital, see if anyone there is in need of being vaccinated. Uh, and from there, um, the, the, the goal is not to waste a single dose. Uh, and I'd say other hospitals have been able to adhere to that. And uh, uh, there was just a, uh, something with, with the policy at CBMC that made them the outlier. Secretary Smith. Stuart, thank you for the question. First of all, I just want to say that the hospitals have been doing an incredible uh, job in making sure that Vermonters get vaccinated across, including central Vermont. They've been doing a, a, an incredible job. Secondly, um, if you look at the total dosage uh, wasted here in, in the state, it's minimal. It's a fraction of a fraction. Um, we've done about, a, we've administered about 170,000 doses. I think the number that I saw was 488 total in terms of wasted. And that includes, you know, vials that are unviable unvi uh, from the beginning. There's going to be droppage along the way. In regard to Central Vermont, I think they've already said they're changing their policies. Um, they, in February, um, had a policy which uh, didn't do what other hospitals are doing, making that effort to uh, reach out to those that um, need vaccine. And they have subsequently, and I applaud them, they said, we're going to change. Uh, and that's something. Just remember, we do provide guidance to hospitals as well as everybody that's giving um, vaccine out there that basically says this. One, you vaccinate the group that is qualified. Two, if you don't, you use your call list and vaccinate and bring people in that can bring in that are within that group. Secondly, if you can't find anybody within that group, you go to 1A, which is healthcare workers. Uh, if you can't find anybody within that group, then you go to what would be perceived the next group. If it's, for example, if it's 65 and older right now, it would be, you know, somebody that would be under 65. And then lastly, and only lastly, and at the last resort, if you have to use that dosage on somebody that doesn't qualify, I have said this at this podium, use the dosage. Do not waste the dosage. Put it in somebody's arm. It's better to put it in somebody's arm uh, than waste the dosage. And I think, by and large, everybody is adhering to those policies. And I think you'll see Central Vermont, um, from what I read in, in the article, I think you'll see Central Vermont changing their policy so they don't have the unfortunate situation that they had in February. Okay, uh, let me just ask you, Governor, about the Leahy news this morning. Um, that's a ton of money, and 400 million you didn't expect a couple of days ago. What's that going to do? Well, the, the details um, will matter, and uh, I've, as I've stressed with Senator Leahy and the rest of the congressional delegation, uh, flexibility is key. Uh, and uh, we'll see uh, how whether those details uh, will allow us uh, to have flexibility. Um, but uh, from my standpoint, again, we know of the needs of our state. Broadband is one. Senator Leahy mentioned that. Uh, if there's uh, enough flexibility, we think there's a $300 million need for uh, broadband to complete broadband throughout the state. Uh, so I would focus on that. We know uh, things like the infrastructure, the uh, the, uh, the number of homes that need to be upgraded or built uh, is, uh, is of great need. Weatherization, uh, we've seen where we've invested in that. My budget uh, uh, provided for that, but there is a lot of need in the future. So they, all the things that, we, um, that you may have seen in the budget uh, that I presented, um, that doesn't take care of everything. So I would say that we could expand upon uh, many of the initiatives uh, that I put forth, and the legislature will have some as well. But, but again, I would resist uh, building a program based on any additional money coming into uh, to the state. Uh, it should be looked at as one-time investments, whether it's in water or storm or sewer or broadband or uh, any mitigation due to climate change. 
All of that uh, is, is something that we know we're going to need in the future, one-time money, one-time expense, and build a solid foundation uh, for the future. But broadband rises to the top? From my standpoint, yes. I mean, we know there's a need. We saw it with the pandemic. It put a spotlight on, on that. We knew it before, but we didn't have the resources uh, to follow through. Yeah. It appears that we would have more additional resources now, and uh, that would be uh, my highest priority. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. <clears throat> Governor Scott, uh, the Islander uh, got a message this morning about what one reader calls, quote, the horrible way, unquote. Military veterans were treated this morning at the vaccine clinic at the Champlain Valley Fairgrounds in Essex. I also spoke to one military veteran who was at the clinic, which basically said there were no appointments necessary, but it turned out that there were only 400 shots available. Uh, this veteran was there by 9.15. Turns out there were 1,000 veterans allowed into the fairgrounds. Eventually, they were told there were only 400 shots. No more were going to be obtained by the VA or the state or anybody. 600 people were sent home while hundreds and hundreds the veterans were still lined up in cars in both directions on Pearl Street, trying to get into the fairgrounds. This vaccine clinic is supposed to run to 1 o'clock, yet I've seen no notice telling people to turn back if they're driving over from the Northeast Kingdom or up from Central or Southern Vermont. And the veteran I spoke to uh, drove down from Franklin County, picked up a vet in Milton, and was in line long before the 9 o'clock start. Yet by 9.15, the police were turning people away. Now, I know the clinic was offered by the VA, but it sounds like there was zero coordination with the Vermont Health Department. And Vermonters are always hearing about the great partnerships with the state and the health department rolling out with pharmacies and others. I'm just wondering, uh, it wouldn't have taken too much for the state to figure out there was going to be a log jam when there was free no sign up, no appointments and everything like that, but yet the state did nothing. So I'm interested in your personal response. What directives can you take as governor, as the CEO of the state, to make sure the health department and other departments are talking to the VA and others so this kind of thing doesn't happen to veterans or others in the future? Yeah, uh, this is uh, somewhat breaking news from my perspective, Mike. Um, but, um, but as you mentioned, this was a VA initiative. There was, this was not our initiative. This is the VA. Uh, as I heard this morning as well, um, I think uh, the mistake might have been made where they opened it up uh, to uh, federal employees, so they weren't all veterans there, um, and uh, that could have led to uh, uh, an overabundance of demand for the supply. Um, we, uh, we want to get people uh, to vaccinated as quickly as possible. Uh, we hope some of those veterans uh, who are in the age bands that are already open up in Vermont will take advantage of uh, the 65 plus. There are some slots available even this weekend, we believe. Um, but um, so we would advocate for them to look elsewhere. Uh, we will do a better job. We'll obviously be reaching out if this is what happened in, uh, in Essex. We'll be, uh, we'll be um, opening up a conversation with the VA uh, so that we better coordinate. Uh, but this was not our initiative. Secretary Smith. Yeah, Mike, as a veteran, that um, what you just described uh, disturbed me. As you know, we have been running a fairly uh, efficient uh, vaccination center at the Champlain Valley Fair through our registration program and through um, you know, the vaccine programs that we've had in partnership with the UVM Medical Center. Uh, this is the first that I've heard that the vet, it's a two-way street, by the way, um, that the uh, VA needs to coordinate with us if they're opening up a, a vaccination site that we didn't know about, I certainly didn't know about, and it's, it, it's a two-way street if they're gonna open up a vaccination clinic. So I will check into this, find out what's going on, but in general, I would say if some of those uh, veterans that are over 65 want to uh, uh, register at our vaccination site, 
this weekend, the Vermont National Guard at the Doubletree Hotel will has some slots. Um, I don't know, now that I've announced it a couple of times, I don't know how many are left, but they have, when I walked in here, they had 106 um, uh, slots available on Saturday and they had 290 slots available on Sunday. So I would urge any of those veterans that are 65 and older, um, brethren of mine uh, that are 65 and older to go ahead and, and try to register online. I will look into what the VA is doing, but again, I've heard nothing but kudos about what's been going on at the Champlain Valley uh, Fairgrounds with the UVMMC um, running of uh, the vaccine clinics that are run through the state uh, registration system, but let me check on that. Sure. Thank you. I, you know, and I, I understand you can't hear about maybe all of the clinics being offered. I mean, it was somewhat advertised pretty well, but I think, I think for most Vermonters, they don't care if it's a federal state or local government, you know, they just want government working for them and they don't care what color the flag is that being waved uh, at that point. But uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, a related I, what, and Mike, I agree with you, and that's why I think you've heard the governor say the more the 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 less that we have these sort of one-offs and and uh, different federal programs layered on top of each other, um, the more confusing it's going to get for the public. And that's why I think governors across the nation are arguing: let's run it through the state um, vaccination program and make it less confusing for everybody as we move. And I'll um, I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, a related question that <clears throat> actually was going to be my first question until that other thing popped up, but it's related to treatment of veterans. Vermont is, uh, Governor, is one of seven states that does not exempt tax, provide tax exemption for military retirees in Vermont. There's been pending legislation for something like nine years. Uh, you've expressed your support for the exemption included in, I think, this budget this year. But the exemption bill is apparently jammed up in the House Ways and Means Committee and possibly being stalled by just one legislator. Now appears it's going to miss crossover on March 19th and never get to the Senate this year. These Vermont veterans uh, are feeling that they're getting ignored and they're moving to other states. Is this the kind of message Vermont and its legislature should be sending to military veterans? looking to come home to retire to yeah. home state. Yeah, Mike, um, this is an issue that I've been putting forward. Um, this will be the fifth year uh, that I've included this in, in our projections on what we need to keep, uh, first of all, uh, to thank our veterans here in the state, one of only seven states that doesn't provide uh, relief uh, that taxes military pensions, uh, does lead to uh, those retirees moving to other states. And, and some of these retirees, uh, by the way, are in their 40s. So uh, we need uh, more people in the state. We need to have uh, more uh, skilled uh, tradespeople in particular in the state, uh, but from all walks of life. So uh, we thought and we still believe uh, that this would, would help us uh, gain uh, the demographic, uh, the expanded demographic that we need, bring more people into the state, and, uh, and again, thank those who... Uh, who uh, dedicated their life or part of their life thus far uh, to serving their country. Uh, and the least we could do is give them a break on their taxes. Uh, so I think uh, the, the net return on having more people, more military uh, retirees come into the state, uh, we would far exceed uh, the, the amount of money that we tax them now. Uh, they would, uh, with sales tax and all kinds of property tax, all kinds of other taxes, uh, that they would be paying if they were living in the state would exceed what we're charging them. So again, um, this is a, uh, a a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart, and that's why I've been trying to advocate for it for now five years. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll never say never, we'll get it across the, the finish line here uh, this year. Well, what can be done in the legislature to break that log jam? Well, on folk, one committee yeah. and possibly by one legislator holding this thing up from a full debate. Folks should call their legislator. They should call uh, legislators and ask them uh, to put this forward. 
it's as simple as that. Thank you very much, all of you, for your answers today. Thank you. Lisa, the AP. Hi, thank you. Um, Governor, when you mentioned you wanted to, you hope to return to the age ban um, after the people with chronic conditions, would that go beyond 60 and up? For example, after 60 and up were vaccinated, you would open up to another age ban or um, I just want, or, yes, or are you going to open it up to everyone at that point? No, it would be continuing the age bans in some capacity. Uh, my, my thought is that we go back to the 60 to 65 first and then move from there. And okay. whether, whether it's done I, in five-year increments or 10-year increments uh, from there on, uh, it would be my hope that we would go to 1665 to 60 to 65. But we have not made that decision at this point, but we're going to right. uh, contemplate that and, and hopefully announce that uh, fairly soon. Okay, and then Dr. Levine, you mentioned the clinic in Stowe and that there's been an uptick there. Um, how big of an uptick and and you have an idea why? Yeah, thanks for the question. There are no specific outbreaks in Stowe driving this, so um, these are more uh, cases and situations, but it turns out that over a period of time this year, uh, in the two plus months that have evolved, the number of cases in the Stowe area equaled the entire year before. Um, and the magnitude of the cases was on the order of, uh, of a city with a population, say, like Burlington, than a city uh, of the size of Stowe. Having said that, all we had to do was get interested in it, and it seemed to level off. Uh, so just putting our intense scrutiny on it, um, it's amazing how uh, the growth uh, suddenly began to cease, which is wonderful and great, but uh, at the same time, uh, you don't. You can never declare success with this virus until you've gone through at least an incubation period, which we've not done yet. And you know, in the interest of protecting all of those who live in the area uh, and allowing them to all do the right thing, testing is the right first uh, starting point there. Okay. And are we seeing a decline in testing statewide? And, and do you feel like people aren't getting tested when they should? You know, we're not seeing as much of a decline as is being reported uh, all around the country, and specifically not seeing as much decline because, frankly, we have so much exuberant college-age testing going on as part of the commitment of the uh -huh. college communities to keeping their campuses safe. But there has been a slight decrease, yes, there's no question. Uh, not a, a huge order of magnitude, but there has been a decrease that's notable. Um, not enough to make us question our percent positivity rate or anything of that sort at this point in time. Um, it's, um, you know, in some ways it's maybe a good sign because there may be less people who feel like they've been in contact with someone who's a case, um, haven't been exposed to an outbreak, are feeling well, um, and don't have uh, a habit of gathering in a lot of crowds. Um, plus, we're having more people get vaccinated, which is always good. Uh, but again, we want to watch this closely because, as I said, we can't declare victory in the beginning of uh, March uh, when we've gotten about 20% of the state uh, vaccinated to this point. Okay, thank you very much. Again, Lisa, um, I just want to uh, thank everyone in terms of our testing ability, uh, the health department and others uh, for their efforts over the last year. We're, we now enjoy, we're like fifth or sixth in the nation per capita in terms of our testing capacity. And that's been part of our success because we've been able to detect and then be able to mitigate uh, and surround and stop uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, my fear uh, is across the nation that uh, many have let up on testing which has led to finding fewer cases, which hasn't been the case in Vermont. We continue to test. We have a robust testing uh, policy. Uh, we, we've been doing it in our schools for quite some time. We've been doing it 
in our, um, our correctional facilities uh, where no one else has been doing that uh, in the country that I know of, like we have. And that, again, has resulted in, in good results. Um, so um, I just want to thank everyone for that and acknowledge that we are uh, high on the list in terms of uh, the number of tests that we've administered. Okay, thank you, Governor. Yes, I believe this is a question for Secretary French. Uh, the school district in Barrie has announced that it will go fully remote on March 9th and March 30th to accommodate vaccine clinics for school staff. We've been hearing from parents who are angry that their students are now going to miss out on two days of in-person instruction. And they want to know, is it necessary to go fully remote during these vaccine clinics and are other school districts doing this? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's too early to tell. I mean, we're rapidly, uh, you know, standing up the vaccination clinics, and certainly our goal is to uh, not disrupt school operations to the greatest extent possible. I do know uh, with some familiarity with the Barry uh, staffing. Their staff travel from some distance uh, due to uh, their location, so I can imagine it would be challenging to a certain extent. But we are uh, trying to schedule the vaccination clinics in a manner that would be at least disruptive as possible. At this point, I'm, I'm unaware of other districts that are, uh, are having to do this, but it's, it's early in the process. And this is probably for Secretary Smith. Um, how do private teachers sign up for this? I think somebody who isn't connected to a school district at all, maybe a child care, you said regulated. Uh, how do people who aren't really connected to a system like that sign up to, the, for, to get vaccinated? Yeah, you know, the education department, uh, excuse me, the agency of education will reach out to both private and public schools to, to basically uh, give them the information that they need uh, in order to register within a district clinic. Now, the, like I said, they will be able to come into that district clinic. Same way with child care. The um, Department of Ch uh, Children and Families under regulated uh, those regulated child care, uh, licensed child care facilities will, will reach out. Actually, the, the instructions are probably going out after this press conference uh, to those licensed. We have the list of all the licensed child care centers in, um, in Vermont. A list will go out to them on how to register and with a, um, the process for registering there. So um, it will be employer by employer and they will contact their employees in order to uh, get registered. Okay, thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I was uh, wondering how much the, the vaccinating the uh, um, school staff is your decision making um, from an economic point of view. Obviously, the, the economy can't fully open until the schools are fully open. It, I, I was wondering how much that, that drove that decision as well. Well, the, it was really about the kids. Um, all the um, pediatricians, um, our own commissioners, our health care team, uh, just all the experts have said, we need to get the kids back into school. So that's what drove the conversation. And uh, um, we want to make sure that we uh, do all we can to get kids back in school for in-person instruction. We know it's good for them. It's good for all of us, uh, good for their mental health and their, their social uh, life as well. So uh, better learning uh, ability. Um, so that's, that's what drove us to the decision we made. And uh, now once we get that uh, aside, put aside, uh, we'll focus more intensely on the economy as well. Given what uh, Dr. Levine said earlier in this press conference about um, Texas, Mississippi, and other uh, states, would, have you considered at all maybe travel restrictions to those states that have lifted their uh, mitigation guidelines? We have not considered that at this point in time. Okay. And lastly, I was wondering if I know that Dr. Levine and I believe um, Secretary Smith are over 65. Sorry, Mike, if, if I presumptive there. Um, have they been vaccinated or signed up for their vaccination? 
I, I don't want to speak for them, although I, I know uh, Secretary Smith is uh, very eager to get his, uh, his vaccine. Uh, so I believe he's made his, uh, his appointment already. I'm not sure about in Dr. Levine. In process. in process for Dr. Okay. Levine. So, so, they're, so they're both in process, it's fair to say. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I want to follow up quickly on Lisa Rathke's question about Stowe. What's going on in Londonderry and Killington as, as well? Both of those towns in the latest town-by-town -town data show greater than 80 cases per 10,000 people. Mr. Levine. And once again, you know, most of what we're seeing in Vermont is isolated cases, isolated situations showing up at a work site, at a healthcare facility, at a school, at anywhere. Um, under 20% of cases in any of these communities, the ones you've mentioned and others, uh, are direct impact of any outbreaks that are occurring. The majority of cases uh, report either household or otherwise contact with a case. Uh, so again, at a time when there's more virus prevalent in communities than we're accustomed to, these are how the cases show up. Um, that's about all I can say. Thank you. Can I just return to last week's report about testing in Bromley when eight out of 237 people Yes. Tested positive. I had a reader point out that that's a positivity rate of 3.4, and she wondered why people weren't alarmed by it. Yeah, those. I didn't check her math. <clears throat> those were um, at Bromley antigen tests, and I I did state at that time that four of them were still being confirmed by PCR, and I don't know if they were truly confirmed or not, so we we may not have. Um, all eight that are positive. The other thing about Got that it. is, though, that um, we were looking at it much more as a glass half full than a glass half empty, because the reality is we thought that was a very few number of positives, and that um, the majority of them, um, well, there was just a few number of positives, period. Um, the theory, I think, that most people were operating on was that there were abundant people coming into the state who were positive with virus, and this did not really prove that based on the uh, percentage who were Vermonters versus percentage who were out of state. So we were looking at it much more that way. The Stratton results uh, were PCR tests, and the number of them was fewer than the uh, number of them that were positive was fewer than the Bromley. But I can look into exactly how many of the Bromley were true uh, PCR confirmed positives. Thank you. And can I just have a clarification, Governor Scott? I heard you say that vaccinated people can gather or dine with other vaccinated people and or with an unvaccinated household. But then I thought I heard you say that two vaccinated households and an unvaccinated household could gather. Can you set me straight? Um, yeah, Lisa, uh, let me see if I can clarify this. So anyone who's been vaccinated um, can gather uh, to any size. If they're all vaccinated, that's no problem. Um, within that group, if they had eight or ten people who were vaccinated, if they wanted to introduce another a household that is not vaccinated, they can do so, one other household only to that group or one-on-one. -on -one, okay. Uh, does that make sense? And can, um, yeah, that does make sense. And can, I, I recall a week or so ago, I think you said unvaccinated people could, as with one trusted household, N not, if they stay six feet yeah. away, windows open. Not. Uh, yeah, w w one, the, the household, uh, stay tuned in terms of, we'll be talking about this more next week, uh, but, but I think previously we'd had one unvac or unvaccinated households, one or, or no more than two, 
um, could gather. And right. we have not d implemented that at this point in time, but stay tuned. Okay. Okay. Much. And, and I, I just wanted to reflect on uh, whether that's uh, the number, I think the, uh, the number at Bromley, the percent positivity rate uh, might be closer over 3%. Um, when you think back uh, or th think about other states, uh, for instance, I think there is at one point in time, there was one state, it may have been the Dakotas, one of the Dakotas was, I think it was a 50% positivity rate at that point. And then the, we thought it was incredibly high when we heard 20% uh, positivity rate. So if it is 3%, that's still very, very low in comparison to to others uh, across the state so, or across the uh, country. So just a reminder uh, that we enjoy uh, here, we have enjoyed from day one a very low positivity rate because of all the actions that Vermonters have taken. Um, so uh, we get lulled into thinking that 3% uh, might be high or 4% when actually from a, in comparison to other states throughout the country, that's still pretty low. Hi, um, I wanted to know, is the J&J &J vaccine going to a certain population or will it be evenly distributed across the clinics that are uh, available? Uh, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer that. Thank you for the question. What we try to do is line up the, the number of people that are eligible within a county and distribute it um, accordingly. Uh, throughout that county. For example, if there's a certain amount of 75-year-olds, if it was a 75-year-old age ban, that's long ago, but a seven, long ago, it's a month ago, uh, we, you know, we would uh, apportion how many 75-year-olds are in that county uh, compared to all 75-year-olds and apportion it that. What we have been doing and what has been successful uh, is that we've opened it up through sort of an allocation formula. And then when we've su seen things that have been over uh, subscribed, we've added uh, clinics and slots to that, uh, to that area. So we've been very successful in doing that and accommodating it to keep the time uh, span pretty short in terms of when you can get vaccinated. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Um, I do have another question um, for Secretary French. Um, how might vaccinating educators impact surveillance testing in schools if some choose not to get vaccinated? Um, will that program, surveillance testing, eventually go away? The, uh, in terms of the surveillance testing right now, we're planning on uh, holding it next week. Um, we are uh, having discussions about its future, but we haven't made any decision at this point. In, in, all, and one last question. in all likelihood, oh. uh, it mm -hmm. would probably go away if we were able to get the vast majority of teachers and staff members vaccinated. Thank you. And um, one last question. Um, how will people know to get tested um, as more and more people get vaccinated and um, with these new lists, I'm just wondering how people will know to get tested. I'm trying to think how the state will still prioritize testing as more and more people get vaccinated. We'll, we'll continue to offer testing as we have. Uh, it's, it's open to anyone uh, who wants a test. Uh, we'll still have our contact tracing. Uh, as well, because there would be a certain number of the population that are not vaccinated. Uh, there would still be uh, positive cases um, because we're, it's going to take us a while to work through, although a very short period of time to work through uh, the rest of the population. Um, so there is still going to be positive cases in uh, the contact tracing in which would we would ask people to get tested at that point. Uh, Commissioner Levine. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> And the only thing I'd add to that is, again, trying to remind everyone, you vaccinate the population, but the virus isn't totally gone. It's still on the planet Earth. 
just like in a given flu season, there's always going to be cases of the flu. What, what the public health world thinks is that there are always going to be cases of COVID, hopefully very few, and hopefully uh, not harming many people at all. But the reality is, um, even during a flu season, uh, some people who had the flu shot may still get a milder form of the flu. Um, other people won't have got vaccinated at all and may get symptoms compatible with the flu. And physicians are testing those people to see if they have the flu. Um, so the same thing will happen with COVID. Uh, testing will never disappear. Um, contact tracing will never disappear. But we hope it becomes a very small part of the work of public health because uh, we'll be at a point in time where the virus will just be around but won't be having this epidemic level of impact on a population. Thank you. I just want to, again, reflect on, um, on the Johnson Johnson vaccine uh, since you asked about it in a previous question. Uh, just to remind everyone where we are, uh, because uh, we didn't know what we were going to receive in the future for Johnson Johnson supply until Tuesday, and we still don't know uh, definitively uh, what we're going to get. So Tuesday, uh, there was a lot of talk about after uh, the authorization over the weekend, uh, there was a lot of talk about 4 million doses being available from Johnson & Johnson to be distributed throughout the United States. As it turns out, the White House, in my conversation uh, with other governors on Tuesday morning, uh, it turned out to be 2.9 million, not 4 million. Uh, and they told us that we were not going to be get, receiving anything next week and a very limited supply the following week. Uh, but they hoped uh, to ramp back up uh, come the end of the month in March. So we'll learn more as we move forward. Uh, but uh, that's. Uh, that's uh, you know a piece of the puzzle that we need to have the answers to before we know exactly what we're going to be doing. Uh, but it looks as though I'm confident that we'll be receiving more of a supply of Johnson Johnson. But but I'm not sure exactly when and how much is that that's going to be. But we'll we'll find that out week uh, week after week. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor Scott. Just a couple follow-up questions for me today. Uh, Governor, I spoke with you a week ago about a nurse in Franklin County that apparently failed to heed the advice of the health department when her own family contracted COVID, continuing to proceed with their daily lives, knowing that they could spread the virus. Uh, at the time, I hope you'd be able to touch base with uh, Secretary French on this and be able to get a little more information. I haven't heard from you or, or anybody at your office about it. Do you have a little more information that you can share with us? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember uh, saying that I was going to get back to you on that, but maybe I did. Um, I don't have any more information. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even have I, any knowledge of that uh, situation, Greg. Uh, I still don't know anything about it specifically. I, I guess at some point maybe I can fill your administration in on it, uh, probably offline. Okay. Um, at, at what point the, the, would the state take more of a punitive approach than an educational approach? At what point would the state say, apparently education is not working and we need to make, take a more punitive approach? Yeah, I, I, beg, I beg to differ. I think the educational approach is working very well. And uh, when you compare Vermont to other states, we've had a huge compliance uh, uh, outreach. Uh, and, uh, and I think that the vast majority of, of Vermonters are adhering to the guidance and doing the right thing. Uh, we're in the last stretches of this race, this war, uh, whatever you want to call it. And we've had uh, many battles along the way. Some we've won, some we've lost. Uh, but we, we see the end is near here. Um, so I would uh, like to look forward, uh, trying to uh, get uh, a number of uh, as much of the supply of vaccination into the arm, a vaccine into the arms of uh, those uh, that uh, are impacted, which we've done, and uh, and continue over the next uh, couple of months, three three months, four months, and uh, get to everyone, and uh, then we'll be back to normal. So 
I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful uh, that we'll be able to progress. I'm confident and uh, optimistic about our future. And, uh, and I think our educational uh, approach, our strategy, has worked very well. And there are, and I'm not saying that not everyone is doing it, but the vast majority of Vermonters are. And I would say if there was a way to, to gauge that against any other state in the country, I would say Vermont's on the top in terms of compliance, regardless of whether there's, I mean, New York tried uh, some punitive measures. I don't think it worked out very well. I think Rhode Island did, others did. I don't think they, it worked out well for them. I think our approach is working and we'll continue with that strategy until we're uh, well out of our way, uh, out of uh, the woods in terms of this uh, pandemic. Well, it, it, I've just heard people who felt that it's a little concerning to see a school nurse that continues to go beyond, you know, within, continues to go to work, continues to go with her normal day, even though people in her own family have, have contracted COVID. But moving on, um, on Tuesday, you announced that uh, Vermont schools would, would begin being vaccinated, uh, although the CDC has said that schools shouldn't need uh, vaccines as a prerequisite for, for opening. Um, I, I asked if this was an indicator of the strength of the teachers' union. Um, I asked that because I'm, I'm wondering if there's any sort of um, agreement between you, your office, anybody in your cabinet, and the teachers' union as the state continues to try to negotiate a change to the teachers' retirement program. Um, no, there's no agreement in any way, uh, no uh, quid pro quo on any of that. Okay. Uh, and lastly, I, I don't think uh, you mentioned how you voted on the marijuana issue on, on Tuesday, and I'll, I'll uh, leave it at that when we're done. I'll take that as your fourth question. And uh, I, I, uh, I, uh, I voted no. I was on the losing end uh, in Berlin, and uh, but I was very... Uh, grateful for having the opportunity to at least uh, exercise my right to vote on that issue. And so we'll move on from there. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your time. Have a great weekend. You too. Tom, Compass, Vermont. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, if I could go back to the uh, pharmacies participating in the vaccination program. If pharmacies are in the federal partner program, but they're not willing to participate at the same time with the state portals, does that disqualify them from being able to provide vaccinations in Vermont? Yeah, I'm going to let Secretary Smith answer this, but this is one of the concerns of myself and many governors throughout the, the country. Um, when the federal government got involved and uh, had their own contracts uh, with the pharmacies, it, it really did uh, hamper uh, some of our control over where we want to go with this. And, and even um, knowing how much of the vaccine has been distributed uh, and uh, what they have on hand, uh, we haven't been able to find out on a timely basis. So it's not a very coordinated effort at times. We're working at it. I mean, everyone's trying to do the right thing. Uh, but, um, but I think the federal government made a mistake in going directly uh, to the pharmacies and making their own contracts with them. They should have just continued to supply the states uh, with the vaccine necessary, let us make our agreements with the pharmacies, and I think that it would be a much more integrated, much more efficient system had they done so. But having said that, we're working with all the pharmacies right now. They're great partners. Uh, it's just that they, all, they have different systems than we do, and. And it's just, um, it's not working as well as it could, uh, but it's working as well as we uh, could hope for. Let me just, uh, let me just add just to, to follow up. Let me just add to that a little bit, yeah, if I may. Um, we have found that the best way to do this is to integrate the uh, pharmacies with our centralized registration system. You, uh, you, Costco, for example, Walmart, are all integrated. Kinney's in a, in a way is integrated. Um, they'll be m more fully integrated in the months to come. 
Where we've had the issue is with Walgreens, which is a federal program. These all get federal allocations, um, and we, well, except Kinney's, uh, but we uh, direct those federal allocations now. Um, and we do uh, have a problem when they aren't uh, associated with our registration system. As the, as the governor alluded, I think this is a countrywide problem in that um, we can't integrate what is going on as smoothly as we can, for example, today with Costco or today with Walgreens as we open it up. We're still having uh, negotiations with others as well as we move forward. So I, I, you know, I, I think it's best if we would integrate through our system and we, we encourage uh, those in the pharmacy program to integrate in our system because it's just easier for Vermonters. Uh, Secretary Smith, if, 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 they, if a uh, pharmacy is unwilling to integrate into the Vermont program, does the state have the authority to decline having them do vaccinations? Through the federal, through the federal program, we could. We, we ha we're working with all, including CVS, who doesn't uh, have a um, integrated system yet. We're trying, but I, as I said, for Vermonters, we're trying to integrate the f f uh, pharmacy system into our own system. And you, have you yet had to reject any pharmacy uh, participation because they weren't willing to work with the Vermont portal? We haven't rejected any pharmacies to my knowledge. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, why didn't you want uh, any cannabis shops in Berlin? Oh, it's just a personal personal uh, preference. I mean, if it was uh, if I had a choice of uh, locating a vape shop in uh, in Berlin, I would feel the same. It's I just wanted you know it's just my personal choice, and again. I'm not upset about it. It's just uh, I'm on the losing end, and, and uh, it's legal in Vermont, and we'll, we'll go from here. But it's just a personal decision. Um, I don't know if this is for you, Governor, or for Secretary Smith. Uh, there are uh, presumably plenty of Vermonters who are under the age 16 who would qualify uh, under the list of medical conditions for, for uh, people that are eligible for the vaccine, uh, but they can't get a vaccine because of their age. Will, will caregivers of those children be able to get vaccinated uh, so as to avoid transmitting it to them? I don't have the answer to that question, and I'm not sure that Secretary Smith does at this point. You want to? Yeah, let me get back. Okay. Secretary Smith, uh, Dr. Levine. Secretary Smith said he would uh, contact you directly, Peter. I appreciate that. Thank you. Pat, WCAS. Hi. I'd like Governor Scott to weigh on this one, please. It's a question about the timeline for getting back to full in-person learning again. Earlier, Secretary French said vaccination would likely have a significant impact on this, but I have yet to hear a promise that prioritizing school staff for vaccines will definitely lead to students being able to go back to full in-person learning this spring. So can you and your administration commit that once teachers are fully vaccinated this spring, that students will resume full in-person learning before the school year ends? No, as you, uh, as you know, here in Vermont, uh, we have a, a very different school system than in some uh, states in the country, and uh, they're all individual. And so uh, we can uh, advocate, we can provide for uh, means for them to get back uh, to in-person instruction, but uh, uh, but I'm not sure that we can force them to do so, nor would I think that that's the best approach. Um, I believe uh, that uh, the the superintendents, the principals, the, the staff, the teachers all want the same thing. They all want to get back uh, to in-person instruction uh, for the kids. Uh, they just want it to be safe in order to do so. We think that this was a major obstacle in, in providing for that. Um, so that's why we decided to go down this path. And, uh, and I believe uh, that we'll see uh, a number of, uh, of uh, schools going
going back to in-person instruction in the very near future. That's my hope. We're um, hearing some rumblings that some staff may refuse to go back to in-person learning even after they're vaccinated, citing issues with things like spacing in classrooms or not wanting to give up some of the flexibility that remote learning has allowed them in their personal lives. Will the choice to go back to in-person learning then ultimately have to be left up to the districts or can the state in some way ensure that students, no matter which district they're in, have equal quality of education if their district is refusing to go back to in-person fully? Secretary French. Secretary French, are you on or muted? Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? We can. Still having some audio problems. Um, yeah, to pick up on the thread of your earlier uh, question about vaccination, I think, you know, firstly, vaccination, it's important for school staff, uh, certainly from an operational standpoint, but more to the point, it just represents the increased supply of vaccine that's coming into the state overall. So ultimately, we expect that to have an impact on the operating conditions in our communities for schools, uh, which means that uh, the potential is there, we predict, for more in-person instruction. So we want to work on that. But it is, it's important to, um, to plan for that now, and that's, that requires, particularly in a local control system, that uh, we build a broad community support for that, particularly among parents. Um, and so they can, they can have their voice heard in that, that conversation uh, at school board meetings and so forth uh, to ensure that the districts um, you know, are, are doing their best, not only for their staff, but also for the students. So it is, it's, a, it is a, it's a tricky thing in a local control state to do. Uh, but back, you know, back to the earlier questions a few minutes ago about um, the punitive nature of requiring people to do things. We've had great success in our schools. Uh, and actually, I would argue one of the key ingredients to our success is sort of its de decentralized nature to a certain extent because it allows communities to be creative to respond to their specific conditions, not just to the virus, but of their staffing patterns and the configurations of their schools. So again, I think you know, we're in the last uh, leg of this race. Um, based on what we've done so far, I'm confident people will figure it out. Um, and we want to support them in doing that. Um, and ultimately, you know, as the governor's mentioned, everyone wants the best things for kids. So I'm confident we'll be able to, to, to do this last piece exceptionally well as we've done the rest of the response to date. I guess kind of some of the foundation for the question stems on this idea that we're kind of rushing teachers to the front of the line at the moment and putting them on the same line as people who are high risk with health conditions who might be at risk of dying if they get the virus. So. The rationale for this is that teachers get vaccinated, kids go back to in-person learning, and that helps their mental health. But if there's no proof that they will, in fact, definitely go back to in-person learning, I think some people who email me are questioning why we're rushing them to the front of the line. Well, again, someone has to make the first step. And we've decided with the extra supply that we have, now this isn't replacing, uh, this isn't putting them ahead of those with chronic conditions. Uh, this is an extra supply that we found uh, that we had that we weren't anticipating. Um, so again, somebody has to make the first move. We think it's in the best interest of kids. I believe most of the, the staff, uh, the teachers, uh, the, the superintendents and, and parents think this is the right thing to do. So we feel confident in our approach and we hope uh, schools will follow suit. All right, I'll leave it there for today. Thank you. Hello, I think this question is for Secretary Smith. Some inmates in Newport are telling their family members they are showing symptoms and medical conditions related to COVID-19, but are not being hospitalized. Is the same standard for admitting members of the community to a hospital with COVID-19 the same standard for admitting inmates to a hospital, such as temperature, high temperatures, and oxygen levels? Thanks, Alan. I'll let uh, Dr. Levine weigh in on this as well because I don't have an MD after my name. But my understanding okay. is not everyone 
uh, that has symptoms is hospitalized. Actually, it's a, it's a very few people that are that have symptoms that are hospitalized. So that's not uncommon, and that's that doesn't strike me as something that's odd. Um, there are certain symptoms that would require uh, hospitalization, and and the department has been pretty good at um, at responding to that. Uh, when they see those symptoms. Uh, as you know, and as uh, Commissioner Baker said, they have a doctor on site um, and on call 24-7 uh, up there in Newport right now. They've augmented their nursing staff in order to uh, respond to this outbreak there. They've cohorted their prisoners, uh, their inmates to make sure um, that th they try to reduce any opportunities to spread. But in terms of symptoms, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine in just a moment. I do want to I do want to respond to something that just came in uh, on an email, uh, one from Senator Sanders uh, staff person and another from the director of the Office of Veterans Affairs. Um, they are reporting that the fairgrounds, uh, this is a vet, this is a program run by the VA, not the regular state-run program that's at the fairgrounds, but the VA program that is being run up there. They do report, both Senator Sanders' office and the Director of Office of Veterans Affairs, that they have not run out of vaccine at that site. So I'll let Dr. Levine uh, talk about symptoms, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, as you've heard, and I've talked directly with Commissioner Baker, uh, they've augmented the medical staff at the facility. There's daily access to care, probably far better than you would get if you were just calling your doctor and saying, I tested positive for COVID and here's what's going on. Um, you're not going to get that level of attention every day um, and be at their office every day. There are criteria for admitting people that do have to do with the state of their vital signs, how much uh, their oxygen levels are, et cetera, <clears throat> if there's a uh, reason to see, to perceive that they have pneumonia or uh, a complication of COVID, which could include blood clots or other things. Uh, I would just trust the medical decision making that's going on there. Um, the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> everyone who is tested positive is a known positive case and um, has access to medical care, and if they have new complaints and new symptoms that develop that become of concern, they would qualify potentially for hospitalization. But as uh, Secretary Smith said, you know, right now, today, we have 24 people in the hospital in the whole state, and we tested uh, 126 positive tests yesterday, and accumulating over the course of a week, we have hundreds and hundreds. Uh, most of those people do not end up requiring hospitalization. And just a quick follow-up follow anyway. Um, is it the same standard for an inmate though as it is for a community member, like the oxygen levels and temperature? I would sure hope so. Uh, any human being. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I, would also you I would also point out, because there was an earlier question today regarding um, the ACLU and uh, vaccination. Um, the fact of the matter is, any inmate that has been in the age bands that have uh, been gone through already has had the opportunity to receive vaccine as well. Can you tell me how many inmates at the Northern State are currently hospitalized or currently receiving supplemental oxygen at the facility? I can tell you that I'm not aware of anyone hospitalized. I don't know the status of everyone's oxygenation level. Um, so I can't give you that information. Thank you. Yeah, you, you could Can connect, I get that information? You could connect with the Department of Corrections and they might be able to give you that information. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. Hello. Um, let's see. This might be a, a question for um, Mike Smith. I have a, an early educator, an uh, early childhood educator who has um, interest in the home child care 
um, rules that are going to be following for the vaccines coming out like next week, um, or actually it's probably the week, I guess it's the week after that. Um, in the schools where there will be teachers getting vaccinated and substitute teachers getting vaccinated, will the same pattern follow for the home child care folks as well, where um, people that they might call upon to be a substitute to fill in for themselves if they are sick or aren't able to be there would get vaccinated. And the other um, piece of that is whether um, spouses or other partners, other adults that might live in the same home where there's a home child care, would they be eligible to be vaccinated as well? It would only pertain to employees that are uh, that are uh, child facing um, in this instance. In terms of the particulars, it would not it would not um, extend to a family, for example, in this in this sort of situation. So it would it would pertain licensed uh, child care facilities where there is a uh, uh, employee who is uh, uh, child facing. Okay, thank you on that. Um, and I guess a, a question probably for Dr. Levine to pick up on that thread where he was talking about sort of how the, the virus will continue to, to be in the environment, to be in, in, our, in our ecosystem to some degree. Um, the vaccines that are going to be distributed and given to teachers are going to keep teachers safe and give them immunity. But sort of getting around this question of kids going back into school and having them be safe I'm not sure how low you're imagining the age bands for the vaccine to go, but I don't imagine elementary school kids are, are eligible for vaccines yet. That hasn't been hasn't been sort of you know uh, figured out yet. Um, so how do we keep kids safe if the idea is to put them back into schools in larger numbers at closer distances? Do you, what does that look like? Do they still wear masks? Are they still being super careful? Because the germs, as you said, are still going to be there, and and they are still. I know kids don't get it to the extent and the severity that adults do, but that still is a risk for them. So, I guess there's parents that are wondering. It's great that we're keeping teachers safe. That's sort of step one. But then, what about the kids when they get into school? Yeah, this is these are great questions. So, um, first of all, we don't have a vaccine that's been authorized for under 16 yet. But I do know that at least one of the vaccine platforms is being evaluated in the 12 and up age group. Uh, so stay tuned on that front because there may be opportunities in the future for kids to get vaccinated with a vaccine that's been adequately studied in their population. Second thing, the um, reality, as you kind of pointed out, is that the very youngest kids, and I'll say that's in the uh, 11 year old and younger group, give or take a year, um, really do seem to do much better with this virus or be not even able to get significantly infected by this virus. And that's still believed to be kind of a physiological aspect of them and some of the receptors in their mucosa of their nose, things of that sort. Um, so they may be safe uh, much more of the time than we realize. Uh, just because of the peculiarity of the way this virus impacts us as a species. And, I think Secretary French had something to add and then the third thing is that the best way to keep our kids safe in our schools is to keep our communities safe. So part of that is vaccinating the teachers, because that's an immediate community. But thinking about the community at large, if the majority of the people living in the community in the adult range who can receive the vaccine, uh, do receive the vaccine, um, and have uh, adhered to all the usual public health guidance, that's going to go a long way to suppressing the amount of virus that can be transmitted from one person to another and make it much less likely that a child will even encounter the virus in the places they spend the rest of their time when they're not in school. And then lastly, in, the, in this future world over these months, at least for the rest of this school year, before we get to the summer and fall, people will be masking. And in the schools, uh, masking will still be uh, a part of everybody's life there, which will continue to protect the kids. Secretary French? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Levine. I was, I was just gonna add, um, 
you know, we, I think one of the things that makes us confident about the spring is that we have really good insight into uh, the operating conditions at any given moment. And that's a function, you know, of our modeling, uh, certainly the robust surveillance testing and the other testing that we have as a state. But we also have maintained pretty significant resources on contact tracing and just the uh, overall epi data that we see on a daily basis and what's going on in schools. So we know right now our schools are operating very safely and have continued to do so. And we have a significant amount of in-person already going on in our schools. So I get this question sometimes for parents, very similar vein, how are our kids safe? And I think people should understand that and have some confidence that we have, have really good insight in any given moment as to what the conditions are in our schools. Um, and we'll optimistic again that conditions will be improving in our communities in the coming weeks. So we'll be able to monitor that very closely. Um, but I think we should have, everyone should have some confidence that we're, we really have some, some good understanding of the conditions. And, you know, the way we, the way we opened our schools was using some of the national and especially international data on impact of the virus on kids, how transmission occurs uh, in the setting of a school classroom. And the reality was, and I think it's been borne out in Vermont, especially in our younger age and younger grades, is that kids are not transmitting the virus to each other. Most of the time, mm-hmm. uh, it's an adult who is uh, a case, and if you appropriately isolate that person and quarantine those who are close contacts, you don't see any further impact. And that um, when a kid is infected, it's often because of where they're living and who they were in contact with in the community, not because of what happened in the school. So I do think our Vermont experience has really borne that out. Um, and allowed us to do exactly what Secretary French said. Well, thanks, Dr. Levine and Secretary French. That was um, th- that's very helpful information and a, a good sort of uh, following the, the, the logic and the process there. So I imagine that you see a COVID-19 vaccine someday not too far into the future being just a regular routine childhood vaccine that, that kids would get? No, I imagine that will be true for sure. And the only issue will be, uh, do you receive one vaccine and you're done? Do you receive it every five years or 10 years, like a tetanus shot, or, or what? Um, all that remains to be understood better. Right. Great. Th- thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, another time check. It's 10 of 1, and we still have 8 left in the queue. Greg Bennington Banner. Hello, thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, this is a, regarding the Vermont Veterans Home, so it could be for you, Governor, perhaps to you, Secretary Smith. Earlier this week, the Banner reported that 60% of all employees and only 39% of direct care staff at the Vermont Veterans Home had been vaccinated. Uh, the Banner also reported the President of the Union representing employees said a vaccination mandate should be bargained. He said, quote, some facilities throughout the country are offering incentives and reinsurances to their staff in an effort to increase the number of vaccinations, maybe that would be a good place to start, end quote. So I have two questions. One, has a mandate for vaccination for direct care staff at the Veterans Home been contemplated or put forward to the union? And two, what's your reaction to the union president using staff vaccination as a bargaining position? Um, Well, first of all, we can't mandate anyone having uh, the vaccine uh, due to federal Mm -hmm. regulations uh, because it's an emergency order an emergency authorization. So it doesn't allow us uh, to mandate uh, that. I would hope um, that uh, as we've seen uh, throughout the state and other long-term care facilities, there's been an incredible uh, uh, outreach and and, uh, uh, inclusion in vaccination and and an interest in vaccination. I think some, I think it was Randolph where I saw they had maybe 90% uh, adherence uh, to the vac- uh, vaccination and, and vaccines. So uh, it can be done. It's, uh, it's disappointing um, that, uh, that they aren't uh, taking advantage of this uh, to protect themselves and uh, those they care for in Bennington. Uh, but, um, but I have no interest in bargaining uh, for this and offering an incentive. I think the incentive is protect yourself and protect those around you. And that should be enough. Thank you. Avery, WCAS. My question is for, likely for Dr. Levine. 
some New York health departments are seeing people still testing positive for COVID up to 30 days after their two-week quarantine. Is this happening in Vermont, and how long can someone be asymptomatic and potentially infectious? So the question is that there are people who have been in quarantine because they were in contact. They never tested positive during the immediate period, and then a month later they tested positive? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can I can speculate, um, not knowing much more about these individuals in these cases. Um, <clears throat> normally, of course, you know we have a 14-day quarantine period because that's the incubation period of the virus. We've allowed people opportunity to test out of that earlier because the predominant number of people will develop symptoms in a shorter period of time. I guess I would submit that if there's developing symptoms and then presumably test positivity 30 days out, they must have had some other exposure or some other reason to test positive during that time period. And, you know, we're in an era now where we're worrying about the variant strains, and the variant strains' characteristic is they are more transmissible. And so people might get actually symptoms and ill in a much shorter timeline. So that, uh, that goes against the increasing prevalence of those strains as well. So I guess I'm saying I don't get it because it doesn't sound to me like it's related to their initial quarantine period at all. It must be other exposures post that 14 day period. Okay, and I just have a quick clarification about um, travel restrictions. So. We're getting some questions from snowbirds who are coming back. Um, would they need to quarantine before going to get vaccinated, or would that count as a medical appointment? Um, and that that basically going to that appointment would be an exemption to leave quarantine for that specific thing. If they're coming back to the state and they have not been vaccinated, they need to quarantine. That's sort of the rule, period. Um, you're then saying they want to go out because they got an appointment to get vaccinated. Um, I would think that would be a rational thing to do. If they wore a mask and they had no symptoms of COVID. Okay, so yeah, that's what I was asking. Thank you. Hello, um, thanks for taking my question. So I know that Dr. Levine touched on this earlier today, but I think it's a good subject to keep discussing. Um, this past week, we've seen a shift in states such as Texas, Mississippi, Connecticut, and earlier there was Florida, all go completely or almost all the way back to normal life in regards to masks and distancing and restaurants opening and whatnot. Um, as the virus season winds down, when can the rest of Vermonters get back to our normal lives? Yeah, we, we continue uh, to use a strategy uh, that, uh, and we'll be able to talk about that uh, more in the we coming weeks and be able to uh, describe what our plan is as we uh, work our way out of uh, this pandemic and uh, open up our businesses. Um, so we'll be able to share that strategy with you uh, in the near, very near future, uh, but it's not today. And uh, it's just a reminder, um, because the other states have done this, uh, doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Uh, you know, we're a state of experiment, or a country of experiments in the individual states. Uh, we all have the ability uh, to, to make decisions based on what we think is right. We've been doing that since day one. It's, uh, it's served us well, um, but, um, but we'll see. I mean, I, I don't think any of us knows what the right thing, the very right thing is to do until this is over. And then we'll be able to reflect on that. But uh, in terms of uh, our strategy, I feel very confident in what we've done. And I think the, uh, the numbers back it up. And we'll continue to do what, uh, what we think is right and take a team approach in doing so. Um, if I may, can I, can I ask, uh, what, are there any specific goalposts as far as, um, I, I don't know, rates of infection or deaths or vaccinations that you can share uh, targets that would be a criteria for reopening. Yeah, nothing I can share at this point in time, but in the very near future, we will be outlining uh, what uh, what we see over the next uh, 
weeks, a few weeks, and uh, in terms of what we need to do to reopen the economy in a much more expedited way. But I, I, I would say, uh, you know, we're on the uh, other end of this, and uh, the, the future is bright. I'm very optimistic about this and enthusiastic, and uh, mm -hmm. I believe we'll be able to share that with Vermonters uh, once we get to a, a point where I feel comfortable enough in sharing it uh, in what we're seeing on the ground and with all the supply of vaccine uh, that we can firmly uh, say is in the uh, in the queue and that um, that we feel confident we'll be receiving. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, good afternoon. I've got nothing today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you. What the hell is that? <laughs> How is that? Uh, Hi, yeah, I do have some things today. Um, Governor, you have consistently said your chief priority is to preserve life during the vaccine rollout by targeting those most likely to die from COVID-19. But your administration has repeatedly made exceptions for this, right? Choosing to prioritize certain professions. We now have cops, firefighters, ski patrol, teachers, soon, child care providers, correctional officers. With the Newport outbreak demonstrating yet again how easily the virus can spread within prisons, I think there's an argument to be made that inmates are among the highest risk group in Vermont right now. And from the sounds of it, we are dedicating an immense amount of state resources to deal with the situation. Given that it would take about 1,100 vaccines to immunize the current in-state inmate population, which I believe is roughly a tenth of a week's supply, what is the rationale for not taking this up? Well, again, it takes a dose away from someone uh, who we feel is in the category, the age banding category that we've talked about. Uh, the strategy is the older you are, uh, the more susceptible you are to uh, hospitalization and death. And we've taken care of the 65 and over we want to continue along that process, the 60 to 65, uh, then in the 50s and so forth. Um, the, those in the correctional facilities uh, will be able to take advantage of this. We've been, we've been doing that right along. Anyone uh, over 65 at this point in time has, uh, has either been taken care of or it will be taken care of in the uh, correctional facilities. Anyone with a chronic condition uh, in the those facilities, in the correctional facilities, will be taken care of as well. We, I feel, uh, we feel that uh, <clears throat> creating a line of defense uh, within the system, uh, because there shouldn't be any other way uh, for this, um, for the transmission of the virus uh, to come into the facility other than through staff and, uh, and, and those who are working from the outside in. So once we uh, take care of that, uh, we should be able to clear up the problem. And we've done so all along the way. And we work on data and science, and the data doesn't prove uh, the fact that they are more susceptible than anyone else. Well, I just want to push back on that a little bit because I'm pretty sure you said earlier in this press conference that we are vaccinating people like teachers not by putting them ahead of people with chronic conditions, but by using extra supply but the, the rationale you just gave for prisoners is completely opposite of that, that you would be viewing that as putting them ahead of the age banding and the chronic conditions. Why are those two things different? So every, in every category, every situation, every profession, uh, we have uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of, uh, of people who want to be put in the front of the line, uh, even before uh, the offender population, uh, whether it be in the retail. The retailers have come out and said they'd like you know, 37,000 doses for those on the front lines. We've had those from the agricultural community who feel those uh, that are uh, in uh, providing for the processing of milk should be put to the front of the line for a lot of good reasons. Um, but uh, this won't end. Uh, and from our standpoint, if we can get through this over the next few weeks, all on the same level, all adhering to the same guidelines, uh, I think we'll be in, a, in good shape and we'll be able to uh, quickly move through this. And uh, so we have a difference of opinion. Obviously, your opinion is different than mine, uh, but we think this strategy is appropriate. Okay, I would just say it's not necessarily my opinion. I think it's Well, I think you said it was your opinion. question that I've been hearing. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think you um, said, okay. in my opinion, I would do this. So I take that as your opinion. I, I don't believe I said in my opinion I would do this. But anyway, moving on. 
It would seem also that this perimeter approach that we're talking about relies on all correctional staffers being vaccinated. But as you said, we can't mandate that. And experience from other sectors shows that take up won't be 100 percent. For example, we had hospitals with accepting rates below 70 percent a month into the phase one rollout. And it also sounds like the state is not offering vaccines to full time contractors. I know of a couple of such who are working in the Chittenden facility and have been since the summer. Don't these gaps undermine this perimeter approach? Well, it certainly does uh, enforce uh, the perimeter, uh, and I and it, it isn't foolproof. Nothing is. I mean, even the vaccine itself isn't 100% effective. Uh, there is a margin of error even in that. Uh, so, and it takes some time as well. So, uh, if you have a two-dose system, uh, you could be talking about uh, a dose, uh, dose uh, a month from now, and then two weeks before your you uh, get to the greatest amount of efficacy. So um, from that standpoint, it's weeks. Uh, and we'll, again, in weeks, we'll be through a number of the uh, population bands uh, that we're, uh, we're talking about today. Thanks. Um, I just want to bring one other subject up. It was brought to my attention. Uh, the vet uh, that uh, Mike uh, had spoken to was turned away in error uh, the clinic remains open for vets with a valid DD-214. Uh, they can also look you up in their system. So if Mike can give us uh, some contact info for the, de for the vet uh, he heard from, uh, we'll have the VA connect with them uh, directly uh, so that we can rectify that situation. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Governor, earlier you, earlier you were asked how the state of Vermont will spend another $400 million from the federal government. Kind of switching tax here, do you know how the U.S. US government plans to pay for all of this unprecedented deficit spending? Um, and if you know, could you share that with us? Yeah, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm sure that it has to do with our, our kids and grandkids uh, and future generations, as with any debt. Okay. Um, question for Secretary Smith, uh, or perhaps yourself. Uh, Senator Sanders' office has confirmed to us that they asked the Department of Agriculture to to uh, give the farmers to families food box distribution uh, to the food bank for its oversight, um, and which sort of pushed some uh, all Vermont, uh, some all volunteer Vermont churches and faith based organizations out of the distribution network, at least at this time. Um, Secretary Smith said uh, he was willing to have volunteers step forward. Has his office since heard from any faith-based organizations about participating in this? Uh, the answer is no, Guy. I haven't heard from any uh, faith-based organizations about participating in this. But as I said last week, and, uh, and I mean this, I mean, Anybody that can help on, um, on, you know, helping those that are in need, I'm always, volunteers, helping those that are in need, I'm always uh, all ears for that. How it would be integrated into this program that was, uh, let, let's be honest, was struggling um, is something that I would work, uh, have to work out. But, you know, along a whole host of lines with human services, um, I welcome volunteers, whether it's uh, foster parents to a lot of uh, other issues where we need uh, other areas where we need uh, volunteers. So if people want to reach out to me, I'm fine with that. And uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, listen to how this can be integrated, whether it's in the food program or any other place within the agency. Thank you. Governor? Um, hi, Governor Scott. Was your administration aware of CBMC's failure to implement a vaccine waiting list prior to our reporting? Um, if it was, why didn't the state address the problem sooner? And if it wasn't, why wasn't the state paying closer attention to that process? Yeah, I don't, uh, I wasn't aware of it myself. Uh, maybe Secretary Smith was, but uh, obviously if I'd known about it uh, previous to that, I, I have a very low tolerance uh, to waste of anything, uh, especially 
these precious uh, doses of the vaccine. So uh, had I known about it, uh, we would have reacted differently. Um, and then Secretary Smith, after CBMC, the Department of Health, White River Junction and Burlington District offices had the highest wastage numbers. Um, can you tell us what went wrong at those two sites? Yeah, I'm, let me uh, go back. I wasn't aware of uh, Central Vermont, but it, it does indicate that we need to be, play, as a state, need to pay closer attention. I do want to put this in perspective one more time as we as we look at this. This doesn't mean that we have we we shouldn't be um, looking at our systems to make sure that it is um, uh, th that they are better in terms of where we're going and, and what we're doing with uh, inventory. But let me just preface this. 488 doses to 170,000 doses that have been, been administered. Like the governor said, one dose wasted is uh, way too much, but it is a fraction of a fraction. Now let me get back to your to, to your question. What happened at uh, Central Vermont? No, I didn't know about it until I saw the, uh, till I started hearing about it uh, through the reporting of Vermont Digger. I heard about it from UVMMC, or from the health network, UVM Health Network, that alerted me to it. We looked into it. We need to refine our inventory system to give us alerts when things are starting to go uh, in a direction. In terms of the other sites, I believe, and Dr. Levine can sort of confirm this, I believe there was, those were vials that were not uh, viable for one, and I think a few were dropped, if, if I remember. And as you know, there's uh, multiple doses in vials, and a few were dropped. This is gonna happen, by the way, in, um, in a very um, sort of labor-intensive uh, sort of operation that we are going to have mis uh, mistakes, and I can understand that. Um, what I what concerned me about uh, Central Vermont was the uh, was sort of getting to the end of the day and not having a procedure uh, to put uh, doses into people's arms. That that concerned me more than somebody accidentally dropping vials. Thank you. Can you hear me now? We can. Go ahead, Carolyn. Okay, great. Um, so we received a flyer for an anti-flashing, uh, an anti-mask flash mob, um, where a bunch of people are getting together without masks on in Chittenden County. And we were wondering if you're aware of this um, or if it's credible, if you are. And when it comes to uh, big public gathering stuff that's being pushed out on social media and whatnot, um, are you tracking these things and, and doing anything about it? Uh, I am not aware. I might ask uh, Commissioner Sherling if he's aware of anything of this nature. He's not on today. Okay, sorry. Commissioner Sherling is not on. Uh, Commissioner Levine. Yes, during the course of this press conference, we have been notified that there was uh, some notification. I don't know exactly the uh, credibility or the veracity of the notification, but about sort of an anti-mask uh, event, if you will, that could potentially put uh, Vermonters at risk if they were uh, unnecessarily exposed. Um, we brought that to the attention of the Department of Public Safety. And I'm sure they'll be following it up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again on Tuesday.